Hi, I'm Billy Hollowell, and welcome to Answering Atheists, a Pure Talk series brought to you by PureFlix.com. I am joined today by Dr. Georgia Purdom. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing very well. So you, you are an expert on biology. You have a PhD in molecular genetics. Mm -hmm. um, so you know a bit about science. Just a little. <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit. Um, a lot a bit about science. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've, we've been talking a lot in, in interviews today about you know, the intersection of science and faith mm -hmm. and how we know for a fact that there's so many people out there, especially on the atheist side or skeptic side, who will say, oh, faith and, you know, science cannot go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You know, science is logic, faith mm -hmm. is crazy. And these are the mm -hmm. things they will, they will say. But as somebody who has intensely studied and worked in the field of science, what would you say are some of the biggest markers that point toward a god? Well, one of the things that I would try to help people understand is that Christians have a reasoned faith. I, I think a lot of people characterize Christians as having a blind faith. Well, oh, you believe what the Bible says, even though science says this. And I always say, well, I'm a scientist. You know, I love science. God created science. Um, he's the reason that we can study and, and work on these things. And I want to help people know that Christians actually have a reasoned faith. Um, we read uh, certain things in the Bible, and because we read those things, we expect to see certain things in the scientific world, and we see those things. Um, and so that just supports and confirms what God's Word says. If everything we saw was absolutely the opposite and different, we'd have no reason to believe it. So um, people need to see that it is a reasoned faith and not a blind one. Yeah, that's a great point. That's mm -hmm. a really good point because that's how it's approached. Oh, these crazy people have these crazy beliefs, and there's no reason for right. it. And yet there's so many people like you who study science and find no problem between mm -hmm. you know being able to remedy those things, bring those two mm -hmm. things together, mm -hmm. right? Right. And it and it's not just that. I mean, and and actually I would say that the evidence um, it clearly <coughs> supports and confirms like biblical creation, the biblical account of the flood, all of those things. For evolutionists, on the other hand, they really have to I always say shoehorn the evidence in because it isn't consistent. It doesn't fit with their evolutionary ideas about the past. So just from a lot logical standpoint and a reasoned standpoint, biblical creation, um, it, it just makes sense. It's, it, we, we read that in the Bible, we see those things, and it, it just supports and confirms it. What do you think the biggest mistakes are that evolutionary theorists make when they, when they put their theory out and they adhere mm -hmm. to it? Well, that they believe it's a theory in the first place. <laughs> um, I would never call evolution a theory because a theory in a scientific sense, that word means that you have evidence to support it. It's gone beyond the hypothesis stage, which is an educated guess, basically. Um, so there's evidence to underline it or to uh, support it. Um, and there really isn't when it comes to um, evolution. You know, people say, well, what do you think is the best evidence? And I'm like, all of it is. <laughs> because, because it really comes down to when we're dealing with evolution and creation, it's really about how do we interpret the evidence in light of our worldview. And that is that is the, the foundational issue. It's not the evidence itself, it's how do we interpret it. And do we believe God's infallible word or do we not? And, and that that's where our interpretation is different. But um, at the same time, I would say things like, you know, we're probably going to be discussing between humans and chimps and, mm -hmm. and things like that clearly support uh, the biblical account of creation. And so ev evolutionists have to devise certain ways to interpret and understand that to try to make it fit their ideas. But it really doesn't. And it takes a lot of finagling, so to speak, on their part to do that. Well, and, and as culture changes and secularism sort of creeps in everywhere, I think there are a lot of Christians, mm -hmm. even in the science world, who will mm -hmm. say, well, you know what? I believe that God, you know, created mankind specifically, but that he did it through evolution right. or that that, w that is the process mm -hmm. through which it was done and that Genesis is recording some sort of story, mm -hmm. you know, that, that God is telling us about how he did it, but that's not literally how he did mm -hmm. it. How, how do you respond or what would you say to those Christians in your view based on your experience? That could take a whole hour. <laughs> um, no, just a brief answer to that. I think there's a lot of things, but I think um, some of the biggest things are that do we really believe God's word is authoritative and true and all that it says, or do we not? I don't see, I mean, if someone's going to claim to be a born again Christian, they're not going to question the virgin birth and they're not going to question the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But those are clearly unscientific things. Those are miracles. Science can't explain them because they're supernatural. So why, why question them when it comes to creation? That's also supernatural. That's something that we can't explain scientifically because it was a supernatural event. So they're being very inconsistent consistent, I would say, in, in their belief system. 
The other big problem that Christians need to see with the idea of believing God used evolution or God used millions of years is that then um, we have what we call the death before sin problem. So you have millions of years of death and disease and suffering before there even exists an Adam and Eve, if, if they believe in that, to sin and sin to enter the world. Well then what's the punishment for sin? Because in Genesis it makes it clear that death is the punishment for sin. But if you have millions of years of death before it, then how can it be the punishment for it? It doesn't make any logical sense. And then what did Jesus die to redeem us from, if not death and suffering? And so, and, and our sin, obviously, because our sin is what caused this. And so um, it, it really, it leads to a lot of theological problems that I think Christians haven't really thought through. What does it say about God? who uses death and suffering to bring everything into existence? Um, what is the point of Jesus Christ, you know, if, if death was before sin? So I think these are some theological things that Christians need to wrestle through and think about if they're going to believe in those ideas. Well, and it seems like evolution is mostly used. The majority of people who are believing it, it's something that takes them away from the notion of a God because you don't, why do you mm -hmm. need a God? There's no right. point if right. you're embracing that. Mm -hmm. It's all an accident. And so it is interesting that people try to find this middle ground of saying, well, maybe Maybe it's true and you know but but I guess going to the broader question of mm -hmm. chimpanzees humans you know is there a connection how mm -hmm. do you respond to to those who would say yes there's a connection and, and this was just part of this survival of the fittest right. process well I say first of all what does the Bible say and the Bible makes it clear that humans and chimps are not related that God created animals according to their kind and then God created man so from a biblical perspective um, that's what we know so from a scientific perspective that's what it should confirm and so one of the things that's often brought up is that humans and chimps share so much of their DNA. You know, we're only one to two percent different. Well, we're only one to two percent different if you only look at certain parts of the DNA. Um, if you look at it as a whole, um, the most recent studies say we're about 20 percent different. Well, that's a lot of differences, too many to account for in an evolutionary time frame. And so, and, and even if we could get all these differences, they just don't do what evolution needs it to do. Mutations don't change one kind of organism into another, no matter how much time you give it. They degrade, they take away, they cause disease, they cause death. So there's just no mechanism to even do what evolutionists need done, so to speak. And one of the other questions that will come off of this goes back to Adam and Eve, and mm -hmm. a lot of atheists, they, they say, no way, Adam and Eve didn't exist, and there's no way that two human beings could be the source of, you know, all mm -hmm. of humanity, essentially. Mm -hmm. Uh, what have you discovered in your research and looking at these issues? Right. Well, I would say, you know, um, looking at this, e everyone knows, at least from a genetic standpoint, the geneticists know that every two, every human being is only 0.1% different from any other human being. 0 0.1. Um, there's really not that much differences between any two humans. So they act like there's all this genetic diversity that somehow we have to account for, that you couldn't start with just two people. But you actually could. Um, and Dr. Nathaniel Jenison, who's an, a geneticist with Answers in Genesis, has done a lot of research showing that and supporting those very ideas that, yeah, you can start with two people and get the genetic diversity that we, that we see today among humans. Now this question might sound sort of silly to you because you know the ins and the outs of this, but the idea that over time one thing would morph into another, that, that would happen and that would conclude at some point and you end up with human beings, let's say. Uh -huh. um, but why wouldn't that happen again? That's a question you'll often mm -hmm. hear. If that did happen once right. and, and that thing is still around, you still have chimpanzees or some mm -hmm. type of chimp, why, why would they A, still be around and why wouldn't that mm -hmm. process continue if that were something that right. had happened So that, that's a very common question. So two answers to that. One is that the reason that we still have chimps today is because evolutionists don't believe, you know, humans evolved um, from a chimp. You know, that's what we, that's the, that's the, the That's a picture. misconception, I think. of yeah. Right. That's a big misconception. It's really that we shared a common ancestor in the past. So there was this common ancestor and then there was a divergence. So humans went off and chimps went off. So that's why we still have chimps today and that's why we have humans today. Okay. So that, that's why we have both. And the reason that we're are we still evolving today, so to speak? And the answer is yes, evolutionists would say we are, but it happens so incrementally, it happens so, um, uh, just little changes that we're not gonna see it. Because evolution takes millions of years, right, to, to go from one kind of organism to another. So we're never gonna observe it in anyone's lifetime. So that's the way that they deal with that question, so to speak. And how do they deal with that 
that link in the middle that would have been where chimps and humans split from? Mm -hmm. Well, they would just say, again, that's 6 million years ago, maybe 13 million years ago, depending on what numbers they're using. Um, they keep having to move it back because we have so many differences that they're finding that they can't account for that. So, that yeah, that ancestor was some sort of, you know, something chimp-like or something ape-like. And they try, they try to find things like, you know, you always hear of some new hominid you know well this was in the line that led the whole you know. lucy thing that was a Lucy's big thing right? one of them sure that that's the australopithecus um you've got other ones that they call homo you know something um but you know we can clearly see if you study them from a fossil perspective they're clearly ape or they're clearly human. They're not something in between. There's no transitional form, so to speak. Um, some of them are extinct ape kinds that we no longer have around, like Lucy, for example. So there's really no way to tell, there's, there's really no way for them to prove that, no. essentially, that theory. Mm -hmm. It's They have a story of what they think happened in the past. So when they dig up all these fossils, they just try to fit it in to their story. But that doesn't prove their story. It doesn't support their story. Um, and even if you, if you honestly look at these fossils, you see there's lots of things missing, so to speak, or they're making a big deal out of one tooth. <laughs> and they, you see a whole hominid, so to speak, and they've got one tooth, or they've got one bone, you know, or two bones. They don't really, it's artist, artistic in, interpretation, so to speak. They don't really have all of that to show that. Now, what was, what was your sort of interest in science? Where did that root from in your life? I don't remember ever not being interested <laughs> in science. I'm one of those science nerds for sure. And um, I always loved science and I knew that I wanted to do something specific in that area. And so your upbringing with faith, were you brought up in a mm -hmm. Christian home? I was. I was brought up in a very um, strong Christian home, and um, my parents loved the Lord, and they loved His Word. And even though they didn't have answers to all of the questions that I asked, um, they always taught me that God's Word was true. And so as I got older then and wrestled with some of these questions, that was one thing that I am very grateful to my parents for, of that foundation that God's Word is true, and we'll, we'll understand. We, you know, we may not understand it right now, but we eventually will understand it in light of that, and it will support and confirm that. Yeah, that's an important thing, just that basic mm -hmm. truth of instilling that in kids, that that right. stays with them if you right. do it the right way. That's the yep. hope and the prayer that people have. And so when you decided to go into the sciences, mm -hmm. was it a challenge at all? Did you encounter roadblocks when it came to bringing you know, faith and science together mm -hmm. when it comes to other scientists? Mm -hmm. I mean, I went to a Christian college, so um, and and they believed in biblical creation and they supported that and taught that. But when I went to graduate school, that was where you know you really start running into people that definitely don't believe the same way that you do. And so I didn't. Um, when those kind of conversations would come up, I didn't really engage people on those because um, there is a lot of criticism for that. I could have potentially not been able to achieve my PhD because of that um, because they were very critical of those things and um, and so I just you know there, there's a time and a place for everything um, and that's not the time or the place and so I was able to you know navigate all of that and successfully get my degree um, and then be able to talk more freely about those ideas and so but I you know it, it was interesting because they didn't necessarily know what I believe they knew I was a Christian but they didn't really ask me about that and just to observe the way that they talked about and the way that they criticized people that believed that way I knew that it, it is it's a very interesting world to navigate because of that. Well, it's an unfor it's an unfortunate world in which people's mm -hmm. religious freedom and free speech right. you have to just contain it mm -hmm. to survive and get your degree so you can right. do the good work that you do. Right, now. exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's, well, it's I always crazy. I always make the comment, you know, even in the Bible, there were times when Jesus said, "Don't tell people who I am," because it wasn't the right time. And, and so I think we have a biblical basis for that, and to be able to get the degree and then be able to do those things. And, and some people even today are scientists that are working in major universities. They're doing great research. They're doing great science, but they're biblical creationists. They just don't make it known that that's what they believe, and they're and they're doing amazing things. Do you get a chance to interact with some of those? I do yeah. sometimes, that's, yeah, that's because amazing. people will come up to me. You know, otherwise I wouldn't know. And they'll come up to me or they'll contact me on Facebook, and I talk with them because they just want someone to talk to and to share their beliefs with and their ideas. And so it, it's a great community out there. What would you say, just as a, a final question, mm -hmm. to those who might be watching who they don't know a lot about science, but they want to be able to answer the questions that you're mm -hmm. answering, they want to be able to find resources, where can they go to do that? 
Well, AnswersInGenesis.org is the best resource that I know of to find information on this because we really do try to take the information that we have, the scientific information, the theological information, and make it really understandable to the layperson. Uh, I'm a teacher at heart. That's what I love to do is to teach. And so I want to make these arguments understandable to people so that they can utilize them. Now, not to the same level I do, obviously. I'm not going to use geological arguments like that. But um, we have like the New Answers books, and we have things that really really um, present it at a lay level so that people can understand, get equipped, and especially I say this to parents, get equipped so you can equip your kids um, because they are going to need this in the world that they're growing up in. Their faith is going to be challenged and they have to know more than just that the Bible is true. That's the starting point. That's the foundation, but how to defend that successfully so that not only for their own faith, but so that they might share the gospel effectively with others. Especially with this, with this upcoming generation. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on today. Oh, great. Thank you. Everyone else, you can tune in to facebook.com slash pureflix and pureflix.com for more daily inspiring content. With over 10,000 titles, it would be impossible for us to show you everything on pureflix.com. But let's give it a shot. 